Send Mail, Chief Science Officer at Send Mail Inc., and someone who's very near and dear to my heart. We're delighted to have you. <laughs> Inside joke, sorry. Uh, my name is Catherine Allman. I'm with the Open Source Programs Office, and I am quite coincidentally Eric's sister, so please forgive my pride. It's here. not a coincidence. <laughs> My parents meant that to happen? Arguable. But anyway, <laughs> Eric is here to talk about domain keys identification mail technology. And without further ado, Eric Allman. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, this is going to be kind of interesting for me. I haven't spoken in front of a really seriously technical audience in way too long. So uh, you'll forgive me if some of these slides are maybe just a little too markety because it it, I did pull some of these out of more marketing presentations. So I'll apologize in advance, and that's the last time I'll apologize. So um, a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, I want to just give you an overview of email authentication, um, uh, an introduction to DKIM, which is one type of email authentication, and some stuff about how it works. Uh, one important part of it, which is currently active in active discussion right now is sender signing practices. So I'll spend a little more time on that. What you do, you know, now it's authenticated, now what? Uh, a little bit about policy management, which is kind of the same thing but in more detail, and a tax against DKIM st status availability adoption scenario. This is a lot of material. And what I'm going to try and do is go over some of this fairly quickly. But if you're interested in something, please you know, raise your hand, interrupt me, whatever. I'm happy to go into things uh, in a little more depth. So um, come on. There you go. So it turns out that the, what DKIM does, the wording is extremely political. There's some folks in the standards community that get really involved in exactly what word you use. So I try and not say something that where they're going to come down on me and say, no, no, you got it all wrong. You see, you've ruined DKIM forever. So DKIM allows the signing of messages so that verifiers can have certainty of the origin of that message. Okay, I'm supposed to put a full stop there. Um, the verifiers are generally the recipients. The signers are, are generally the uh, uh, senders, but that's not necessarily true. Uh, DKIM is primarily there to address phishing um, because it's all about identity, and phishing starts off being pretty much identity fraud. Uh, but uh, as DKIM becomes more widely deployed, it should start to have a real impact against spam, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. The, um, the proposed standard, proposed standard, by the way, is a formal term, which is why it's in caps. It's just a one step on the standards track for IETF. Um, uh, the base standard was ratified in May, which means it's an official RFC right now. Uh, and the SSP document is not yet ratified. And uh, there was a meeting just yesterday. I had to update my slides this morning, in fact. So you've got they're hot off the press, just a couple hours old. Uh, and there's a bunch of other related drafts in progress, which I'll do a quick skim over. So um, the nature of the internet. You know, I don't, shouldn't have to tell you guys about this at all. I assume I don't, because you guys did most of this, so it's all your fault. Uh, there's a huge amount of information available, um, so forth. What do I want to get out of this? Physical location is increasingly irrelevant, so the, the security approaches that we have used in the past, like seeing somebody's photo ID doesn't work because you have to be in the same room. Borders are irrelevant, which means laws become meaningless, and you have to start thinking about things in different ways. And uh, it was always true that not all information is true, but it's even less true, or it's even more true that not all information is true. Less information is true than it was before. You know, you know the standard. I read it on the internet. It must be true. Yeah, right. And uh, so it's really all caveat emptor, or really caveat lector, let the reader beware, is the proper Latin for this. So what we've been using to deal with spam and phishing and fraud and so forth, so far has been uh, what's generally called content scanning. You look at the message and you uh, try and determine whether it's good or not. 
some of you may remember the uh, big paper called uh, A Plan for Spam by um, Paul Graham a couple of years ago, where he, and he said, you see, the weakness of all spam is they have to get the message across to you. And so we can recognize the message of spam, and we will be able to eliminate spam in our generation. I, I think that uh, uh, Bill Gates also said the same thing. They were both wrong. Um, and we are getting up to the point where content scanning is really good, but we can't go a lot further with it. And it's sort of like chips, right? We're getting down to the atomic level, and you just can't go further than that. So you know, what do we look for? One of the ones is URL reputations. Well, people move around their websites. Literally, a website now will be up for maybe five minutes at best, and they will move it. And that's specifically to get around URL reputation. They don't have time enough for people to recognize that URL as being bad. Naive Bayesian classifiers, they legitimize the content by putting in big blocks of other text. They use noise words. They permute the things. There's all kinds of things they do. And sometimes they can do a very, very good job. Um, text analysis in general, they just switch to something else. They'll switch to uh, you know, images and PDF. We've seen a lot. Just starting to see some spam now that's audio files. You'll see video clips soon enough. Uh, you know, smell a rama when it becomes available. Uh, don't even want to think about that spam. Um, and of course, people go, well, OK, you can use image analysis. Well, the problem with image analysis is it tends to be on skin color or something like that, which isn't very accurate. So you know, the famous quote by, uh, uh, who was it? Juster Stewart in J Jacobus versus Ohio 378 US 184, which more or less summarized to, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. And that remains, by the way, the legal test to this day. So we'd like to get into identity-based filtering. Um, Roughly speaking, if I know who the mail's from, I can make a whole bunch of assumptions. So you know, I'm really likely to take mail from my sister uh, without bothering to scan it to see whether it's spam or not, in particular, because if it is, I know where she lives. So um, m for most people, 90 to 99%, it's really, for most people, closer to 99% of their legitimate email comes from people they already know. And uh, you know there aren't exceptions to this. Help desks, for example, that's not true. Um, you know, info at, so forth, sales at. Our salespeople really do do want to get cold calls. Um, white lists can reduce the false positives. So if you know who it's from, you can let stuff through. Content scan the rest. Uh, also, 90 to 99 percent of the spam comes from people they don't know. Now, this number is probably closer to 90 than 99 percent. Um, there are, I think I've actually got this elsewhere, a, a disproportionate amount of my spam comes from people, seems to come from people that I know. And so somehow spammers, you know, we've got social networks, they've got social networks too, and they're figuring out sort of if they can steal somebody's address book there's a really good chance that they've exchanged mail both directions. And you can start to build up uh, the social network and figure out how to spam and defraud people based on that. So you know, I don't know why people haven't talked about that more, because it's, it's really pernicious. Um, so you'd like to do identity filtering. But the problem is with email and the standards that were uh, created you know, 20, 25 years ago, you don't really know what the identity of the sender is, because nothing's authenticated. So, oops, wrong button. So um, for this per reason, we're getting into sender domain authentication. Notice the use of the word domain. This is not user identity. This is the domain identity. So um, uh, DCAM or other authentic SDA technologies can tell if you came from Google, but can't necessarily verify who inside Google you are. The principle here is that if you can push it onto a local administrative domain is the um, technical term. Uh, it is up to them to police their own uh, place well. And if they can't do that, they should get a bad reputation, because a poorly managed site is just as bad as a site that's explicitly evil. Um, so I, this is pretty obvious. I've pretty much said it, identity-based filtering. Um, the concept is identify your good mail, get rid of the most of it. There are two basic technologies which are out there today for center domain authentication. The first is called sort of path-based. 
Um, SPF and sender ID, which is actually more properly known as SIDF, uh, which is backed by Microsoft, is, is one of them. And I'll do a quick skim over this. And then the signature-based schemes, such as DKIM, uh, work in a fundamentally different way. And I'll talk in that in great more detail, of course. So um, the address-based, IP-based, or path-based, I've seen all of these words around, uh, work on they only validate the last hop, i.e., the most recent place the mail came from. So if it gets forwarded, it's less useful. So the idea is, if I'm, I'm an email server, uh, I get a connection uh, from some IP address, and the initial, all I know is that IP address. Okay, and uh, then later in the protocol, it says, hi, I'm example.com. I can look up example.com and say, hey, is your IP address 10.20.30.40 uh, one of the ones that you claim to send mail from by using a DNS record, which is uh, uh, SPF or uh, SIDF? If the answer to that is yes, then it probably is from, or at least in theory, it's from example.com. And if the answer is no, well, you know less if the answer is no, because it might have been legitimate mail from example.com that got forwarded from somebody else. Um, et cetera. Um, it's very, very easy for the sender. All the sender has to do is put a record into DNS and they're done. Now, mind you, there's a lot of things about, uh, uh, I know one uh, large, indeed, international bank, one of the biggest, that decided they were going to do SID um, and first had to figure out who legitimately sent on their behalf. It took them six months of people, a team of people working full time to figure that out because they had outsourced so much and they were so distributed that it was a real problem. So I say this is easy for the sender. Well, that's after you've done the, the scut work. Um, it does break message forwarding. Um, the signature or cryptography-based systems um, are just what they say. You know, um, the uh, I get mail from example.com. Um, I I then, using DNS, go to, or excuse me, I get mail that claims to be from example.com. I go to the real example.com and say, what's your public key? I've then got a signature that's in a header field in the message, and I can verify that, that uh, it was signed by them. What that really means, of course, is it verifies that it was signed by somebody who had the private key. And so you've got to keep that stuff secret like any uh, asymmetric cryptography. So uh, domain keys was one that uh, Yahoo did uh, early on, and DKIM pretty much started from DK as a base and built on that, uh, putting in various operational experience that we'd learned. Uh, it's very secure, um, and it does survive forwarding. Uh, but it's more expensive computation, although not a lot more. These days, uh, we don't have to worry too much about cryptography overhead. And it is. Um, susceptible to even innocuous message uh, modifications. So for example, if you send something through a mailing list and it puts unsubscribe information at the bottom of the message, which a lot of them do, it has now broken that signature. So that's, that's both a feature and a bug, depending on where you're sitting at the moment. By the way, I should say, um, uh, for the path-based stuff, uh, folks like you are breaking this. Okay, increasingly, for a lot of domains, they're going to be outsourcing that to some place that has this huge pool of IP addresses that's shared among a huge number of domains. And so if I get something from a small company, I see an IP address that just said, yes, it came out of that huge cloud. And that's, so as time goes on and this scenario becomes more common, this will become less and less useful, which is one of the reasons why I think signature-based is really important. So, um, DKIM. So again, I, uh, forgive me if this is oversimple. If, if um, you want me to go faster, just go like that. Uh, <laughs> so it allows the signing of messages, I, I pretty much said that, so that verifiers, i.e. typically receivers, can have certainty of their origin. It signs the message, or sign messages from legitimate desired senders can have guarantee of delivery. So in fact, if I get something and I see it's from somebody and I know I want them, that message, even if it's 
you know, an advertiser, but I want their advertisements, it will get through, okay, if you've implemented it right. Eventually, when you uh, have a, a lot of this stuff signed, uh, you can start to throttle back unsigned messages. You can't do that immediately because we're going to start off, we are starting off in a world where most messages are unsigned. It's primarily, yes? Yes. Uh, the question is about the, the cousin domain problem, and I've got a uh, whole slide on attacks against DKIM, and that's, that's one of the big ones. And yes, I do have some answer to that, although maybe not what you want to hear. Uh, okay, it, it is primarily designed to address phishing, um, but uh, you can actually go more as it becomes more signed. When more and more messages greater percentage of messages, legitimate messages, are signed than unsigned messages look more and more suspicious. At that point, you can start to use this for other things. So uh, this is one of those things that has a strong network effect is essentially what it means. Uh, it's based on, you know, nice, simple. We did not decide we were going to go invent a new cryptography scheme. You wouldn't believe how many people think that they can build a better algorithm than this team of mathematicians can. We just use OpenSSL. Um, it is d intended to be industry-wide, internet scale, published standard, raw, raw, so forth. I, actually, I can't take this off. I have um, DKIM started with a group called ESTG. I have an ESTG t-shirt. The Email Signing Technical Group, which is a bunch of vendors who privately got together in a room and said, we realize that uh, spam and phishing is killing our industry. We have to do something about it. And by the way, they were all technical people, and they did not tell their management they were doing this, because they knew if they did, management would step in and say, we want to own it. And uh, the group of companies, including vicious competitors in the outside world, got together in this room and said, none of us can own it, because if any of us own it, it won't work. And so it was actually one of the greatest uh, experiences of um, cooperation inside the industry I've seen in a long, long time. So goals of DKIM. Uh, the technology should be available to everyone without cost. There's a lot of measures of cost here, but in particular it means there can't be patents against the standards, it can't be proprietary code, uh, it, you can't have to buy in for you know, some online service in order to use it, et cetera. It's really genuinely got to be free. Um, no new internet services. Uh, PKIs have been in play for, what, 30 years now? And, and someday in the next 30 years, maybe they'll get one that the industry can agree on. I don't want to wait that long. Uh, no trusted third parties required. So uh, that's pretty much a code saying, I don't want people to have to go to VeriSign to buy a cert in order to use this. Okay, VeriSign's a trusted, well, it's a third party, which a lot of people seem to trust. Um, no client user agent upgrades uh, required because there's just too many user, upgrade, user agents out there. Getting to all of the servers, the SMTP clients and servers out there, will be hard. Getting to everybody's laptop who haven't upgraded their system since Windows 95 is effectively impossible, and, and we just said, let's go with reality here. Which doesn't mean that user agents can't make use of this, it's just that it's not required to get some useful functionality out of it. Minimal changes for naive end users, uh, things like uh, send securely buttons and user agents have not worked, even though they've been widely available for a long time. Users don't understand them, they don't want to think about it, it's got to be as invisible as possible. Also, if they get a message, one of the big discussions was, oh, use S-MIME. Well, if you don't have an S-MIME aware reader, then suddenly the user starts getting stuff that they don't understand in their mail. And uh, my mother will call me because I'm her support, and uh, that's not a support call I want to take. Gee, Mom, I'm sorry about that. I did it, but <laughs> uh, it needs to validate the message itself, not just the path. That was because of the, the problem I explained earlier. Uh, needed to allow sender delegation, i.e. you need to be able to outsource. In, in the commercial world, outsourcing is incredibly common, and so this thing has to work with that somehow. And there's at least two 
ways to do that. And that requires limited user keys. So for example, I can give a private key to a marketing company so that they can sign as me, but I only want them to be able to sign as a particular user at my domain. They can't sign as the CEO. Um, and it needs to be future proof, that is to say extensible and so forth. We, we already, in the process of developing this, we were using SHA-1 and SHA-1 got deprecated in favor of SHA-256 because SHA-1 turned out to be weaker than we had thought. And I pretty much guarantee you SHA-256 will prove to be weaker than we think now. And so we have to be able to think about SHA-4096 or whatever it's going to be. So what DKIM does? It does provide gateway to gateway authentication. That is to say, from the edge of the sender's administrative boundary, their outgoing SMTP client, technically client, think of, people think of it as a server, to the recipients, or I should say verifiers, incoming SMTP. That's basically the boundary. If it goes through other hops in between, that's fine. We don't care about that. Uh, whereas uh, path-based do care about that sort of thing. Uh, on the other hand, it's not end-to-end. -end. It's not you know, my user agent sitting on my desktop to your user agent sitting on your desktop. And there are weaknesses with that. It allows signers to assert responsibility, whatever that means, for a message. Uh, that's another one of those words that's getting heavily debated right now. Um, signing a message should indicate that you're willing to be judged on the basis of that message. In other words, don't sign crud. Um, so uh, a good implementation will say, uh, uh, particularly if you've got a place that's hosting many domains, you don't want to sign for any domain. You just want to sign for the ones that, where you've audited them, for example, and you know that they're going to do a good job. Allow delegation of signing keys to third parties uh, is the outsourcing thing. Sign transparently to non dkim aware readers. This is the mother support problem. Um, it's also uh, an issue that it has to go through SMTP servers that don't know about DKIM without getting trashed. So an SMTP extension was an automatic non-starter because of this. Um, and actually, that's the other point. So, OK, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that DKIM doesn't do. Uh, it doesn't tell you whether you want to read a message. Okay, It just says where it came from. but. Um, you know, spammers can sign their mail. Fishers can sign their mail. It doesn't do per user authentication. We have SMIME and, and PGP for that. That's largely a matter of key management. You say you can delegate a key upon a per user basis? Yes, but the way the key distribution is done in DNS right now, it doesn't scale uh, to per user kind of things. So Yahoo could, which has, I think they told me they've got 50,000 domains hosted at Yahoo. 50,000 is within reason. 10 million or however many users they have is not. Uh, let's just say DNS would come to its knees really quickly with that. Uh, it doesn't do encryption. Uh, you can use TLS for hop-to-hop -hop encryption, but uh, encryption was just not part of what we were trying to do here. It doesn't solve the cousin domain problem per the question earlier. So uh, you know, look like domains such as ebaybilling.com. That just happens to be one of the early famous ones. And it doesn't do semantic analysis of the header. So in particular, the real name and email address might not match. You can get something that says, from bank of example. And then in brackets, it says evil at fishers.com. And most user agents are only going to display bank of example. And they're not going to display the rest of it. And I will talk about that later. So let's look a little bit at the technology overview. Um, we do use a, a, a header field uh, called DKIM signature. Uh, it, after a lot of debate, we decided to not tie the, the signing identity to some specific other field in the header. It's just contained in there. And the verifier gets to decide whether they want to believe that or not. That's, um, we knew that was contentious. And it's really starting to hit the fan right about now because it's all about SSP. The public key is stored in DNS in a separate subdomain called underscore domain key. Uh, the underscore guarantees it won't conflict with any existing names. Uh, we have set it up so that in the future of other key distribution mechanisms come along, we can extend it there. But, um, but we don't right now. And key pairs you create locally, you don't have to have certificates, i.e. you don't have to have a signer for this. It's just a simple key pair, a public and a private key. Ergo, no third parties. 
Uh, the namespace can be divided up using something called selectors. Um, essentially, uh, this allows any domain to have multiple keys. They can you know, delegate some of them off to other people. They can rotate them over time because keys, you know, keys rot with time, uh, as is unfortunately not as well known as it should be, just like passwords. Um, and if you find an unsigned message or a message that's signed by somebody you don't necessarily trust, uh, you can do a sender signing practices lookup, which I will talk about more. So let's get into the dirt here. Um, or meat, sorry, meat. Um, this is a, an example of, of a DKIM header, which is partially contrived. Uh, in particular, these binary fields here are really longer in real life uh, than this, but it had to fit on a slide. So it's just a series of things called tags. They are, you know, some some keyword, most of which are single character just to keep them short, a equal sign and then a value. Um, the uh, A is the algorithm that you use for signing. So in this case, it's using RSA uh, encrypt or signing algorithm with SHA-256 hashing. Uh, query mechanism is using DNS looking for a text record. Uh, in theory, we can extend this to another record type in the future, but there are are uh, large companies, uh, some of which are uh, in a state north of here, who say they can't do that. And so uh, we kind of had to go with the flow there. The domain that actually signed this is example.com. Then there's this thing called a signing identity, which is optional. And it gives more information on how you sign things. So for example, you can sign with subdomains and so forth. This turns out to have maybe not been a good design choice because it's causing lots and lots of problems right now. Uh, the selector name is, in this case, june2005.eng. Uh, it can be pretty much anything arbitrary as long as it's a legal part of a subdomain name. Because, because um, messages do get slightly modified during transmission, like sometimes uh, MTAs will add blank lines at the end or uh, you know, make other small perturbations like that. Some of them are, make really major perturbations. Most of them make small ones. We've got a canonicalization algorithm. And uh, there are two, con two canonicalization algorithms called simple, which does almost nothing, and relaxed, which is a little more willing to allow changes in the message. And this is for the header and the body of the message uh, as indicated. You don't want to sign the entire header because, of course, headers do get modified regularly as messages transmitted, you know, fields get added and so forth. And so what this is saying is the signer signed the from header field, the to field, the subject field, and the date field. And those are the only ones you use in the signing calculation. Um, actually, I should put this in the other order. BH is the hash of the body of the message, and then B is the hash of the header, including the BH tag. So you basically hash the hash. Uh, and the DNS query is made, in this case, to the name of the selector, june2005.eng. underscore domain key, which is a constant, dot example dot com, which comes from the D equals. So, the um, recipient, of course, now needs to take this thing and get the public key associated with, with uh, example.com. And that's going to come back with something that looks kind of like this. Uh, in this case, my selector name is an arbitrary S1285. It's a text record. Um, it's got a version field on it. The, that, believe it or not, was controversial right there. Uh, it's an RSA key. This just says you're in testing mode. And uh, this long. Base64 encoded, not quite Base64, but real close, um, value is, in fact, the public key. And it's stored as s 1285domainkeyexampplecom OK. Now that you have this, what can you do with it? Well, boy, that's not very exciting, is it? But actually, this is useful. You've got a message. Does it have a verifiable signature? No, you do exactly what you do right now. I just put it up as content scanning, but you can use that as shorthand for whatever it is you do right now. Okay. If it is a, a, uh, it's signed and verifiable, is that signature from a known friend? If the answer is no, you do exactly what you do right now. Otherwise, 
you deliver the message. So not, not exactly uh, rocket science here, but it is useful because you hope that a huge number of your, a uh, huge percentage of your legitimate wanted mail will go down that left-hand side. Okay, but we do want to do better than that. And that's what uh, sender signing practices are all about. Um, so we have to deal, allow unsigned messages to be legitimate for now. But there are places like banks that really want to uh, sign all of their messages really soon. Yes? Yes. So could you just say a few words about what you think known friend means at that level? Damn, they caught me. I was trying to wave my arms. Uh, <laughs> known friends can be, for example, domains that you just want to trust. If you're a business, you probably want to trust your business partner's domains. Yeah, you don't particularly care who inside that. Uh, there are existing today uh, white lists of well-behaved domain names. There's more white or blacklists of uh, poorly behaved domains and IP addresses. The other thing is that there's something I'll get to called reputation. And so you can build reputation. So even if you don't actually know someone, then uh, you can find out whether that domain has a history of sending out good mail or bad mail. So that's the not quite as arm wavy answer to that. Um, so. Banks want to start signing everything immediately and asking the verifiers to say, if you get something from us that's unsigned, it's not from us. Something that seems to be from us. So you just ask the sender, do you sign everything or not? So uh, who's the sender? What we're doing is we're using the, the from field. Even that's being debated right now. Um, somebody just came up with a kind of scathing attack against SSP just day before yesterday where he talks about that. Um, how do you ask? We're just going to use DNS. We're using DNS for the keys. What information do you get? Ah, that's the rub. And uh, you'll see what the current definition is, but that's changing really fast. So the latest SSP proposal looks for something called underscore SSP, which is still an underscore domain key. Uh, it will look up one domain level so that you don't have to actually they may have pulled that out. There's a big debate about whether you want to walk up the tree or not. But I think that we decided to go up one level only. Uh, and that's to deal with people who try and fake subdomains. Um, and uh, I'll show you more about the practices later. So this is our big project right now. The SSP record is actually pretty simple. Um, it just says, in this case, the policy or practices, rather, is unknown. This can be unknown. I.e., I sign. I might sign some of my mail, but I don't sign all of my mail. It can be all, which says I sign all of my mail, and strict, which says I sign all of my mail, and I want you to be, you know, please be really strict about this and don't allow things like third-party signatures. Uh, there's a handling field that just got added and may just get taken out, uh, which essentially says if you it doesn't match, do I want you to just drop the message on the floor, or do I want you to try and process it some other way, like doing content scanning? And this, the T equals S um, says, in this case, this does not apply to uh, subdomains. So don't walk up the tree. And that's just stored in the domain key uh, domain. So yes? You mentioned it goes up one level to prevent people from uh, scooping subdomains. Yeah. So for example, Yes. You, what that means is if you've got legitimate domains, you have to, in fact, put, put records at every level in your tree. But you don't have to put them in for individual hosts. Okay, and that's the whole point. Um, so in fact, if you've got, you know, if all you've got is www dot something and smtp dot something and so forth, then you only have to put it at the example.com level. But if you've got, you know, eng dot whatever, you do have to put one at the eng level. And that can deal with www.eng.example.com. So here's the algorithm now. Um, this left-hand column looks pretty ordinary. But the, uh, 
Now you say, does the sender sign everything, which you find out just by asking them. And if they sign everything and they want you to be strict about it and, and you are feeling pissy that day, you can just reject the mail outright. So that kind of adds that new piece in. And like I said, the financial institutions and PayPal's and Ebay's and whatnot really, really, really want this. But there is that question, which you jumped on prematurely. And so um, we have to deal with uh, the next step, which is not in scope for DKIM, but is DKIMs and enabling technologies to deal with reputation and accreditation. Now, um, authentication, of course, I said this, the fishers can authenticate as themselves. Uh, there's no problem with that. It's free to everyone, including the bad guys. Um, so what you want to do is say, all right, now that I know it's from them, do I want to accept this mail? And that's usually generically called reputation. Accreditation is a form of reputation on some le level. Accreditation uses a trusted third party, um, like uh, Habeas does this, where they'll go in, audit you, and then give you a Habeas stamp of approval, put you on their whitelist. Reputation, on the other hand, looks at what you have sent in the past. And usually, the accreditation vendors also monitor you. And if you turn bad, they pull your accreditation. Um, in the short run, this can be a slow changing list of the big senders. So for example, you can get the list of uh, accredited uh, financial institutions in the US. And you can put them in on the assumption that banks probably aren't spammers, probably. Um, big brand names, uh, so forth. But in the long run, we absolutely have to have more dynamic lists. Uh, there's just no doubt about this. There'll probably be some kind of collaborative effort based on feedback and whatnot. We've got uh, Vipple's Razor, for example, which is a, uh, like that, but it doesn't do domain reputation. It actually does message reputation. Um, and uh, there are actually some ISPs where I've said, would you contribute your data to the world? And they haven't said no. So um, that's actually a good sign, rather to my surprise. Now, one thing to know is that something like you know, 2,000 domains get registered every day. And most of those are registered by bad guys. But some of them are registered by good guys. And we don't want to build a net where no, one, no new legitimate player can get in, because it's just assumed you're evil. So we have to be, um, you know, when you come in with a null reputation, we have to make sure that that can be used. So a little bit about what makes a good reputation system. It's pretty much the obvious stuff. It needs to be up-to-date data which is hard. Um, and it needs to be pretty complete, which is hard. Um, it, you need to have more subtlety than just good, bad, uh, because you're going to be combining a lot of information here. Uh, you, it, ideally, you'd be able to federate with other reputation systems, because everyone's it's like you know, the blind man and the elephant. You're all getting different views of this one thing. And of course, you need meta reputation. Does the reputation provider have a good reputation? Because of course, the spammers are going to set up their own reputation service where they say, oh, yeah, he's great. Take all his mail. <laughs> so this eye chart here um, is kind of a, a sample of what you do in context. And I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly. The stuff in blue here is the uh, authentication and reputation. So you know, first thing you probably do is look up IP rep. A lot of people do this, and you reject it if it's on a blacklist. This is just DNS BLs. Uh, you might want to, for example, check SIDF first. It's really cheap to do. If it verifies, you can probably continue on through and not do the DKIM check. So this, by the way, there's people are going to argue about this, and you know, knives will be deployed, and so forth. So this is just my example of something that might happen. Um, you might then check DKIM. Uh, if it's not verified with either SIDF or DKIM, then you do the standard stuff. You spam, scan, and, and so forth. And by the way, always virus scan. DKIM should never, reputation should never stop virus scanning. If you um, do get some kind of authentication, you check the whitelist and reputation. If it's known good, you might want to add a little gold star to it to pass downstream for further processing. Uh, otherwise, you might someday, if it's known bad, uh, you might reject it. Otherwise, you go through the standard thing. That was very fast, and I apologize, but I'm running a little late. So what do I do with all that information? Um, the trivial case is you just say, accept, reject a message. I, I accept it, or I. I uh, throw it away and nothing else. And, but 
that's really not good enough. At a minimum, you need some kind of one-dimensional scoring. So you might say, you know, a neutral reputation gets heavy filtering. A really negative reputation just gets rejected outright. But in between is quarantined. Do light filtering if you are uh, pretty good but not great, and just accept it if you're really good. So policy management. Um, there's going to be a lot of policy comes in, not just about reputation and, and authentication. Uh, you're going to have traffic information, proof of work status, the preferences of the final recipient, um, et cetera. And there are places that are going to do this hard-coded. There are places that are going to have a, a whole policy language. Um, Spam Assassin has kind of a, a language, if you can call it that, but it's just for one-dimensional scoring. Um, you should probably be doing this on outgoing as well as incoming mail because you know, I was at one company where we discovered we had a salesman who was running a cocaine business using our email. Um, not good. Um, this is, there's going to be a lot of innovation going on here. So in the future, the algorithm's going to look more like this. You're going to take you know, DKIM, SPF, SIDF, traffic flow, domain reputation, IP reputation, user preferences, the phase of the moon, et cetera, put them into this great big black box, and out the bottom is going to pop a whole bunch of possible outcomes, including accepting it, quarantining it, rejecting it, slicing it, dicing it. So tax against DKIM. Well, the first one is, of course, you just include a false signature. You're a fisher. You, you say I'm from you know, bank of example, and you, but you sign as, as evil.com. Um, the fix is that verifiers shouldn't be stupid. If they can be tricked by this, um, which, by the way, some already have, then they deserve what they get. Um, you can, there is an, an L equal um, flag, which will say, I only want to verify this many bytes of the body. That was contentious. I don't believe it's a good idea, precisely because it opens up this attack but if you can get a body that is legitimately signed but uses L equal, then you can, and you can steal that. Then you can add stuff to the end of it. And particularly if it's HTML, you can actually have it on the screen overwrite the stuff that's already there. So it looks like a legitimate message, but the end user sees the, the evil message. So the fix is don't use L. Um, you can include a real signature from a bogus domain sign forwards the from field. Uh, if, the, if the sender or recipient rather just says, oh, it's signed from anyone, this is really very close to the first one, um, then you're kind of SOL. So you really have to kind of correlate what signed it to what the user is going to see and so forth. Um, this is the, you've got a real signature from a domain that is not in fact associated with who the, it appears to be. So, you know, accounts at secureexample.com. Um, Reputation should help with that. Okay, so if, if you will, example.com will have a good rep, but, but uh, secureexample.com will have a null or bad rep. And so you have to make assumptions on that. By the way, semantic analysis of this domain name, which some people have proposed, is probably not a productive approach. And uh, another one is rotating domains quickly to avoid the bad reputation. And about the best thing you can do is say, if you've got no reputation at all, then it probably is suspicious, uh, but not fatal. And um, uh, the verifiers, the reputation services, should share data as quickly as possible. It's got to be very, very timely. But we are talking, in this case, these days, five minutes windows, sometimes three hours, but sometimes as little as five minutes. So there's a bunch of RFCs out now that you can go read about uh, uh, the, the uh, base one, 4871, is the critical one. There's a bunch of drafts that are being discussed now. I really, really want pe to encourage people to go read these things and comment on the list. We don't have enough input coming in, and so there's some people who are able to uh, unduly influence the group. Yes. Yeah, the, um, it's true that banks right now can't really use email very much precisely because they have the phishing problem. And the best 
the best solution so far has been don't believe anything that appears to come from your bank. They would really like to change that. Um, they, the uh, quick communication with companies or with customers would be very valuable, lowering costs, all kinds of stuff. They really want to do this. They're pouring you know, huge amounts of money into trying to fix this problem so that they can do that. So that's true short term, but I don't believe it'll be true long term. Uh, they are trying to do things like this. They're trying to come up with other ways to secure both their websites and their mail. Um, you know, we should probably talk about that afterwards because you know it's mostly a grab bag of tricks. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that reputation was important, but how do we prevent measures from generating their own reputation? That's the meta reputation problem that I talked about. There will have to be some kind of reputation of reputation servers. And um, how do we do it with uh, DNS BLs today? How do you know which DNS BLs to trust? Turns out I saw at, uh, oh, maybe it was a MAUG conference, which technically I'm not allowed to talk about. But uh, somebody did a, a survey of DNS BLs and found that a few of them were very good, but the vast majority of them were mediocre. And some of them were worse than tossing a coin. So they were just incredibly bad in their, the quality of their data. We do that today by some social process that says we know which reputation servers are good. And there'll be a small enough number of them that that can work. We're talking tens or hundreds, not tens of thousands. Like having VeriSign do it. Yeah, like we'll just have VeriSign do it. Um, Let's see, these are the drafts um, on the table right now. Um, there are a bunch of implementations. Um, we've got an open source implementation. Uh, Alt N has one for Windows. You can go out and get that. Um, there are, uh, the IETF is working on this. The big controversy is around SSP. Does it go too far? Does it go far enough? What does identity mean? Anyway, you mama is kind of where the conversations tend to end up. And uh, it hasn't been all that productive. So please participate in this. We've got people making sweeping claims with no data. And they just figure if they say it loud enough, people will believe them. And we'd really like to have some data. Um, I'm going to skip this next slide because it's not really relevant. Uh, adoption scenario. Now, this is just kind of how. You might expect that DKIM will actually come in. Email people are, tend to be pretty conservative. But um, you're, we're already seeing large um, targets that are doing some kind of signing. Uh, uh, you guys sign, actually, although I don't know that you're the big target. Uh, Bank of America signs. Uh, eBay is signing, I believe. Um, I think PayPal is signing now. Um, and then some of the large receivers will start verifying it. Um, I don't know if you guys are verifying um, signatures at this point for incoming mail. I do know that Yahoo is verifying signatures incoming and using it. And, and some, they're getting more and more draconian about it. Uh, so, sorry? Oh, I guess it was somebody in the next room. The large receivers are going to start pressuring other large senders to sign. Uh, this is already happening. Yahoo has gone to some large senders and said, starting next year or sometime, if you don't sign your mail, we are going to start throttling it. It'll still get through, but it's going to back up on your servers. We're going to severely limit how much you can send in a given unit of time. Um, at least that's my understanding. Obviously, I don't work at Yahoo. Percentage of good signed messages should increase at that point, and um, then the unsigned ones start to look rare. So the, the basic stuff is, is out there. There are implementations. There was an interoperability session in Dallas a few weeks ago, which showed very, very good interoperability between implementations. Um, it's usable in its current state, even though there's more to do. Um, we, uh, the world is still evolving. And there's definitely a lot of stuff going on, uh, but we have to do that trying to put our foot in the really big mistakes. But we're going to make some mistakes. It's inevitable. You have to or you don't move. And uh, reputation servers are the next big thing that we have to worry about. So sorry that ran on a little long.
I've got one minute and 30 seconds for questions. <laughs> yes. Is it an eventual goal, thinking back to the S-MIME thing, like is it an eventual hope to wrap S-MIME with this technology with SSL on the, AT, on the SMTP connection so that you just hit it with a thousand different ways? Or we, we've, not talk, we've not talked about merging S-MIME and DKIM, for example, uh, or PGP, whatever, because they work at a different level. So fundamentally, it's a layering issue. You don't want to do TCP stuff at the IP level. So I don't think that will happen. There will be other symbiosis that comes along, however. I can see uh, TLS certs, checking TLS certs at the hop-to-hop -hop level merged in with DKIM gateway-to-gateway -gateway level things because often those two things are the same thing and there's kind of compatible data. They're also both about domains as opposed to end users, which the end-to-end -end stuff is. But And I'm sure there are new technologies which... Uh, none of us in this room have even heard of, or at least I haven't, that will come along and, and fit in there as well. There's already some proposals to extend DKIM to add some other information, for example. Okay. Yeah. The other follow-on question, of course, DNSSEC, will it be real one day? DNSSEC, will it be real? It, just because now we're, we're trusting DNS with one more bit of information. When we started this thing, people said, oh, but DNS isn't secure. And we said, well, yes, that's true. But on the other hand, if you can crack DNS, which of course you can, um, DKIM's the worst, the least of your problems. Okay? So the final decision was we'll do this knowing that we're building on something that's you know, kind of shaky quicksand and whatnot in the hopes that we'll push people over the edge and get them to go, oh, wait a minute, maybe we actually need to do this. Will people do it? Yes, they will. After a major event that is disastrous, that makes the front line of every newspaper in the U.S. And I'm, I hate to be so cynical, but that's what motivates people to do security stuff, and it motes the, motivates them for about three months, and then it goes away. We've seen that over and over and over again. People say, oh, yeah, security is very important. Here's your budget, zero dollars, until such time as they're on the front page of the paper, and then they go, oh, did we say zero? We meant to put a whole bunch more zeros and a five in front of it. And then they yank it later. I'm not bitter. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, um, thank you. I'm happy to hang around for questions afterwards for those of you too shy to speak up in public. <laughs>